In this final chapter, uh, we start to learn about alcohol chemistry. All right, so alcohol are a broad class of compounds, um, with, which are compounds that basically contain this OH functional group. All right, so oftentimes we'll think of ethyl alcohol, which is just two carbons with an OH. That's common drinking alcohol um, as the alcohol, but really alcohols are a really broad class of compounds. We saw in our handout a couple of things, just some introductory things about alcohols. And also that uh, one of the things we learned is some of the naming. It's always important to know names of compounds. All right, so one of the things we figured out is that this would be 2-butanol because we would number it in such a way as we've seen before so that we could put the uh, functional group, that is the OH group, as part of the longest chain. That's not an issue here since it's just butanol, but if we had a really large uh, compound with lots of branches, of course the OH would need to be part of the, that chain. All right, so even if it's not quite the longest, but the OH group has to be part of the longest chain that it would include an OH group. We also saw in that handout that something like this could be referred to also as sec butyl alcohol. That is a different name for a more what we call a common name for this compound, and just the fact that it's on the secondary, it's a secondary alcohol or on a secondary carbon, so we call it sec butyl alcohol. One of the nice things about alcohols, and one of the things that makes them um, have a lot of different properties, is the fact that they can hydrogen bond. All right, so the hydrogen bonding ability, we recall, uh, comes from the fact that we have an oxygen um, that has a negative, and that's what has electrons, doesn't have negative charge, but has electrons, and they can then hydrogen bond uh, to something else, and that would be a hydrogen uh, that would be on something like another alcohol or on water. And recall we often use three or four parallel lines to show that hydrogen bond. So that's a really strong attraction. And so again, remember that's got to be an oxygen or nitrogen with these lone pair of electrons. Then we have to have a hydrogen that's bonded to either an oxygen or a nitrogen, um, and that can form a hydrogen bond. Um, most often we see hydrogen um, bonded to an oxygen or nitrogen. Remember, it can happen with fluorine, but commonly we're going to see these as oxygens or nitrogens. That would be the key thing. But that hydrogen bond is important. Remember, this is the strongest of the strong non-covalent forces. Um, and so as a result, then alcohols tend to have high melting points, high boiling points, basically really strong interactions for those non-covalent forces, and that's important. Um, regardless of how we show this, oftentimes parallel lines, sometimes it's a dot, dot, dot. I recall that this uh, hydrogen bonding is, is sort of like um, having a reaction that's going to, uh, going uh, um, it's a bronsted lowry interaction that, uh, between here. And so it's almost as if these electrons are going to pull off that hydrogen and those electrons are going to go there. But um, usually these bonds are stable enough that we form much more um, hydrogen bonding than we actually undergo reactions. But uh, you want to make sure to review our handout uh, to look at some more of these introductory comments and ideas. Uh, but the key thing is to make sure we know how to name it, both sort of the systematic IUPAC name, the common uh, way of like sec butyl alcohol, and understand how hydrogen bonds impact the properties of alcohols. Let's continue with this theme of this brunsted lowry acid base reaction. That was going to occur. Remember, I said that alcohols, when they hydrogen bond, sort of resemble um, a Bronsted Lowry reaction that's set to happen. Um, and again, typically we form hydrogen bonds, but we can react, and sometimes water uh, can actually pull off a hydrogen that's here. Um, and then that would create this aux oxide ion and H3O. Plus. Now, this does not happen uh, very rapidly because water is really not that strong of an acid or a base. It's sort of in the middle. Here, of course, it would be acting as a base, and the alcohol is an acid, and acids, or I'm sorry, alcohols are really not that uh, great of acids, as we'll see, and there's some things uh, that can change that. Noticing, of course, that uh, this is an equilibrium reaction. We see that capital K there that stands for equilibrium, and recall that that K, uh, which we'll call K hey, here because it's acting as an acid, um, is part of the equilibrium, and how we would set this up is that we would have the products on top, including the hydronium ion. And then we'd also, on the bottom, just have the alcohol, ROH. And again, we're not going to include water. Uh, this is an aqueous-based reaction. Um, so 
in this particular case, um, we would not include water, so this would just be our Ka expression. Again, why we don't include water is it's basically dissolved in water, so the concentration of water would not change, and so it's not included in an equilibrium constant expression. Now again, this is Ka, why this is acting as an acid, so we often call this K lowercase a. If we're reacting as a base, we might call it Kb. Also recall that one of the ways that we can use this is we'll get a number uh, for Ka. Sometimes it can be quite large or quite small. An easier way of understanding that is to take the pKa, which is the negative log of the Ka value. All right, and so that will give us the pKa, and that number is oftentimes a number that's between, let's say, 1 and 100 or so, or 1 and negative 100, and it allows us to sort of understand uh, the types of um, uh, Ka values that this could have and given as a pKa. So here we see a table of that. And uh, again, noticing that um, the values uh, for the Ka are converted here to pKa. And so we see numbers that are sort of in the, the 15 range, 15 to 18 range. And that's fairly typical. And notice as we bring this back, we see water here going from about 15.7. Uh, some alcohols go up to 18 or so. Um, that can change. And again, remembering that the lower the number, the closer to zero and more negative, it's stronger acid. So most alcohols are actually less acidic, um, in this case just straight alcohols, um, than compared to water. Maybe this is just methanol and ethanol and moving on forward. Notice one of the things that can change the acidity and actually make it more acidic than water is the addition of fluorine or some sort of halogen there, um, which can actually increase the acidity, make it more likely that a hydrogen goes away and that this reaction goes forward. So this is actually lower uh, then the water, noticing um, we have chlorine in this case, fluorine here, three fluorines, and actually drops it a little bit more, and we'll talk about why that is in just a second. All right, so this helps us to think about the acidity of alcohols. Uh, remember this, this, we've seen this before back at NMR when we found out that alcohols, um, they do not um, give much splitting in NMR because they're somewhat acidic, um, and that helps to basically... Uh, get rid of that uh, splitting in NMR. And so this is ultimately why uh, that's the case. So a couple of things about the, the acidity. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Is that the al alcohols are definitely more acidic compared to haloalkanes and alkanes. And so we see that here. We have methanol. Again, it's reacting with sodium amid. Um, notice that, again, the sodium amid is a pretty strong base. And so the equilibrium constant, notice the bigger arrow here, that's a hint that this lies further in this direction. So there's more movement in that direction, smaller arrow, less movement in that direction. So we're going to align more uh, to this side. And you can see the pKa values of this. And again, remembering, of course, that the lower the pKa, uh, the more uh, stronger acid there is. Notice in this case, we're driving from a stronger acid, 15, to a weaker one. And that is the natural tendency, is that reactions tend to go from species that have higher, I'm sorry, that have lower pKa, so they're more acidic, um, to higher numbers, such as this one. And again, if you, that's the natural tendency, and if you look at the Ka value, it's 10 to the fifth, not 10 um, to 19.5 value. So it's a really large number when we would pull it out. And so this larger, so many more products. And so this is, um, reactions tend to go in this direction um, when, we, when we have um, acid and base species that are going from stronger acids uh, here to weaker ones. And so we tend to see that in the equilibrium constants where it bears that out. If we notice, of course, we have the difference in arrow. Again, if we had something like a metal hydroxide, we can also bring this in. And again, notice that this one's going from pK at 15.9 uh, to 50, pK of 15.7. All right, so that's why there's a little bit more of an equal arrow that um, we are going actually in a stronger direction, uh, but the difference is not so great in pKa's. But the key thing is is that metal hydroxide, so sodium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, they also provide these alkoxide uh, ions, and these are actually can be very useful in things like SM1 and E2 reactions, and well, SM2 and E2 reactions would be the, the best place. Can can react in an SM1, but not as not as likely. Alright, so again, the point is, is that this oxygen atom helps to stabilize the charge, and so when it gets in this position, um, this can be a fairly stable compound. So we can find out that the steric part of alcohols 
and also some inductive effects really influence the acidity of alcohols. All right, so a couple of things. That's the strongest acid would be something like methanol. All right, so methanol is going to be stronger than if we had a tertiary um, alcohol. Remember, of course, tertiary alcohol would be something like this, where the central carbon is tertiary, CH3. All right, so this one's going to be weaker. Why is that? Well, ultimately, when we lose this H, um, this sort of steric bulk is going to limit uh, how much of the solvent can surround the O minus. So in something like methanol here, notice this is carbon with three hydrogens, and there can be lots of solvent molecules which can help stabilize uh, that negative charge from the oxygen. If we stick in these methyl groups in something even larger perhaps, then notice that there aren't as many solvents. There aren't just the number of them that can surround this. And as a result, the fact that this negative charge is not surrounded and solvated as much compared to a methanol makes it less soluble and also less likely to occur. All right, so this alcohol can still occur. It's just less stable uh, with the oxygen having that negative charge. All right, so that's a little bit of how the steric uh, bulk of these compounds can actually interrupt um, the solubility and the reactivity of these, uh, these alcohol compounds. Now I want to talk about the inductive effect. All right, so we saw the steric effect on alcohols. What about the inductive effect? Well, just to define it, first of all, the inductive effect is the transmission of charge, both positive and negative, through sigma bonds. And these, we recall, sigma are the single bonds that occur. All right, so they can add, pull away charge, or potentially add positive or negative charge through those. So what does this mean? Well, this goes back to that table where we saw chlorine and mostly fluorine um, was actually making alcohols more acidic. All right, well, the fact that chlorine is electronegative, or fluorine, or some of the other halogens, and notice that they can pull electron density to them through sigma bonds. So if we have something like this, which is an alcohol, just the H is gone, and the chlorine's here, noticing that the chlorine is pulling that negative charge to it. And so it's ultimately removing some of the density of this oxygen and pulling it to itself through these uh, covalent bonds, sigma covalent bonds. This phenomena is known as the inductive effect, all right, or the phenomenon is known as the inductive effect. And this would be an example here for this 2-chloroethoxide, all right, and so when, the, when this is gone. So, um, and so again, this helps to stabilize this O- minus because it's pulling some of the negative charge away and ultimately would make this compound a stronger alcohol uh, compared to just, say, two carbons, which would be ethanol. All right, so this one's stronger, has a lower uh, pKa value. You can check that out back on the table that we saw. The more halogens we have, so we saw an example of three fluorines earlier, that would increase the inductive effect um, because there are a greater number of electronegative groups, and that would pull the electron density through those bonds even more. All right, and so um, and that's important. But also notice that the distance from the oxygen atom um, influences this as well. So this chlorine, you know, one, two bonds, really, um, from that oxygen. The further we would get the chlorine away, uh, it would have less of an impact, and the closer it would be, uh, would have a greater impact. All right, and so that's how we see that. Recall that these are just dipole arrows. Um, if that's not coming back to you, and notice that the dipole is going in this direction. And that points from the end of positive to the more negative end. All right, so that's overall the phenomenon of inductive effect, and um, and uh, it helps to increase the acidity of alcohols. Electron pairs in alcohols uh, can make these basic. All right, so um, and, that, and we're going to see that here. But first of all, let's make sure we use this word: is that we say that alcohols are amphoteric. All right, what does it mean by amphoteric? Well, amphoteric means that they can act as both an alcohol, an acid, um, and a base. And so we see here that having these electrons on this oxygen can make them basic, that is, that it can absorb a proton from another one or from a solution and become an alcohol here. All right, so going in this direction, it's actually acting itself as a base by absorbing that. Notice they go from here to there, we require a strong base, but once in this position, then it can act as a base in that direction. Here we already know about the alkyl oxonium ion, and again, um, it acts as a strong base in this direction. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, uh, it's again delivering a proton here, making it more acidic. All right, but nonetheless, it becomes an alcohol 
uh, but or this fits in this position. It can become an alcohol as well, but coming as a base. All right, so this is important uh, for us to understand uh, that alcohols can act as both an acid and also as base, as a base, and that makes it amphoteric. Some actual applications of uh, alcohol and its chemistry um, can actually uh, be formed, alcohols can, by synthesis gas, which we often just refer to as syn gas. All right, so this is important because notice we have here, we have carbon monoxide, right, which is poisonous to humans and other organisms. Um, but if we had carbon monoxide and in the presence of hydrogen gas, um, then we can make something like methanol which is, again, a synthesis gas, synthesizing alcohols um, in a gaseous form. Notice this is not um, just trivial. Notice that above the arrow we have a couple of things. We have uh, the catalyst that is needed for this. We have fairly high temperatures. And then also noticing the pressure um, is 50 to 100 atmospheres. And notice that our normal pressure is about 1 atmosphere, just everyday pressure. And so it requires high amounts of gas pressure, high temperatures, and also a catalyst to get this to occur. Uh, but nonetheless, if we could form this uh, compound, then this can actually be used, uh, for instance, in uh, production of energy. Um, this is sometimes referred to as a fuel cell. And so once we produce the methanol, then we can use it in a fuel cell, in something small like this even, um, to actually power some little digital board or power something else. So on a larger scale, maybe it could power um, you know, a reactor or something along those lines, a larger reactor. But nonetheless, um, Producing the methanol this way then can allow it to be used in a fuel cell right, and as a way to get energy. So it's one way that um, scientists and engineers are looking uh, to create um, more uh, ways that we can use alcohols. And again, because the breakdown is really just carbon dioxide and water. Other natural resources uh, can be a starting point for uh, alcohol production as well. So taking coal from you know things that we can mine out of the ground, the presence of air, water, Remember the little triangles delta uh, produce the carbon uh, carbon monoxide and also um, hydrogen, uh, which could then be used here for the synthesis gas, and then just the presence of methane. All right, so methane is uh, of course natural gas and those types of things, but the methane um, and presence of air or in other conditions can also produce this, which could then ultimately produce methanol, which would be a great uh, fuel source because this could be a liquid and it could actually then power. Uh, various things. All right, so these industrial sources are are, are, are things that we uh, many scientists and engineers need, and society needs ultimately to power the future. One of the ways that we can also make alcohols, besides from these synthesis gas and these large sources, is in the laboratory, is through SN1 and SN2 reactions. Here we see an example of an SN2 reactions, and where again we have a long chain has a bromine on it, so in showing this. Um, here we have water, um, some base, we have our solvent, and this undergoes an SN2 reaction. All right, so again, this is solvent. Remember, um, sol um, SN2 reactions are really favored uh, when they have a polar aprotic solvent. All right, so this one's hexamethyl phos phosphoramid. All right, and so uh, we have this phosphorus group, oxygen. nitrogens here. And again, so this phosphorus atom, again, can hold more than four bonds. So it has a double bond here with the oxygen. And then has these uh, mid groups that are here. And notice that there are two uh, methyl for each one. So there are a total of six methyl groups that are coming off those hydrogen, I'm sorry, those nitrogens. And uh, so that makes it polar um, because of this, and then also that, but then also aprotic. And, um, and that there, there are no hydrogens coming off directly off an oxygen or a nitrogen. All right, so that makes it polar aprotic. And so, again, so this is really acting as the solvent, but includes some water and some base and allows this to happen by an SN2 reaction. All right, and we know that mechanism well in substituting for bromine uh, the OH group coming from there to generate this alcohol. Notice uh, this would be a great reaction yield, about 92%. Equaling that, uh, we can get about 90% yield from an SM1 reaction where we have bromine, um, again, breaking away, being replaced by water. And again, remember SM1 reactions, they always end up with a little bit of E1, so we can see some of that here. Uh, but nonetheless, we get the bulk of it 
as an alcohol. Uh, that's here. And again, noticing that this is a secondary alcohol, so that's uh, permitting the SM1 reaction to occur in this particular app. All right, so these are just a couple of big picture of the types of ways that we can produce alcohols.